Oh my god! Oh my god! August the 4th, 2020 is a date etched in the heart of every Lebanese person. The port explosion in Beirut was a catastrophe of apocalyptic proportions. It was one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history and it devastated the city. 218 people died, 300,000 were displaced and it was $15 billion in property damage. The tragedy struck Lebanon at a time when the country was already mired in a severe economic crisis with a plummeting currency massive layoffs and harsh banking restrictions, all fueled by massive political corruption. Once celebrated as a beacon of secularism and prosperity, Lebanon now finds itself at a crossroads. So I travel to Beirut to understand what life is like in a failed state and witness the unshakable Lebanese spirit. It stands there like a, almost like a monument. It's a reminder the, for Lebanese people. Sure, but it's also like a strange symbol of where Lebanon is at. Well, we had a Teams meeting, we finished my call. Me and three other guys in the office. And I look, are you staying here all night? What are you up to? Come on, let's go. For a brief second, something like startled me, I don't recall exactly what happened, but I do recall the feeling. And it's like, whenever you're jumping in the pool and you want to do like the... the <laughs> Some yeah, you want to you wanna swirl around, you know, and you could feel the bubbles and everything and you don't know which way is up. This is exactly how it happened. I just loud bang and I saw blood dripping on the ground. I just like started shouting, everyone is okay, everyone is okay. So. I went down quickly the stairs, everyone, the alarms, everything is sounding, everything was very loud, very, very loud. Chaos. It's chaos. I come down and I see like there's a huge line of people, all red and all sitting. Across the street, the trees were falling, cars were trapped. It was on, uh, Armageddon. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. Managed to go to the hospital, I managed to, to get myself fixed. What was it like in the hospital? It must have been chaos. Uh, butchery. There are people without faces here. There are people with, uh, with bone showing. Like, uh, it's uh, something I, uh, I don't want to see again. You could see the, the devastation. And, uh, and in this, all of this mess, you could see hope. People are sw swiping the street. People are helping each other. People are giving blood. Unfortunately, the government did fail us that day. Couldn't see any help from them. August the 4th, that's now a date that is firmly in the mind of Lebanese people. Yeah, you can say before and after the 4th of August. Yeah. Many people like divide their lives into before and after uh, because it was like the Lebanese uh, 11th of September, we can say, you know, the uh, sound was huge. It was uh, heard in everywhere in Lebanon, you know. Heard in they, Cyprus? Uh, yeah, it was heard, in, they felt it in Cyprus. So here in Lebanon, everybody thought that it's next to his house or to his place. I heard a story about many people uh, uh, who at that moment said that's uh, enough Done. is enough. I'm not going to keep my children or uh, uh, my beloved people stay in a place uh, where at any moment I can get killed just because uh, a group uh, of uh, corrupted people uh, don't want to do uh, their work. You know, again, we know that this is a system, a corrupted system, but at least when it comes to our safety or to the safety of our children or to our beloved people, we thought that they won't mess up there, you know. That was the main thing in the 4th of August that changed. We believe that it's not a political system, it's a group, a group of uh, gangsters, it's a mafia. Thugs. Yeah, thugs maybe. Uh, we, call, we like to use the word mafia. Everywhere in the world you have mafia, but I'm not sure if there's any other place other than Lebanon where they are in complete control of everything. All our crises, even the 4 August cries, were because of the corruption. Economic-wise, political-wise, safety-wise, everything is related to, to corruption. We really think sometimes that everybody in Lebanon is corrupted because politicians are corrupted, employees are corrupted. If you want to go to, um, to do papers 
uh, anywhere in Lebanon, any minister, any, any place, you need to bribe the employee to get what you need. The mafia in Lebanon is getting stronger, okay, because they, they are getting used to what's happening and they are covering themselves. It's omerta, like in Italy, in Italy, you know, nobody can talk. If one talk is eliminated. All the Lebanese people lost their money in the banks. And we know that they did that and uh, they are unreachable. They put some law to be unreachable. What happened is that they put around $80 billion at the central bank. They took the depositors' money, whom they were giving high interest, virtual interest, okay, and they put it at the central bank. So we consider this money has been stolen and, and not lost, which is the biggest financial crime that could happen, okay, in history, in the history of the world. Some people think that maybe we will get our money back. They are uh, living the dream. It's a dream. <laughs> August the 4th was this moment in time. It was like everything before August the 4th and everything afterwards. And like everyone was used to the corruption and the banks failing them, the inflation. But at the point of the port explosion, they realized it was, you know, it was far worse than this. It wasn't just that there was a corrupt government stealing money. It was a government that was so relaxed on safety that you essentially had this bomb built up uh, within the port, which without the proper due care and attention to you know, keeping an area like that safe, you know, exploded. Our left, uh, we have EDL, which is Electricity du Liban. It's our Ministry of Electricity, as you can see. No windows, no whatsoever. And that's due to the infamous port explosion that happened in 2020. They are actually employees inside of it, but they're working underground. They just do paperwork and all this kind of thing, documentations and stuff. So, so explain to me, what's actually happening with power here? Because you say this is the Ministry of Electricity, <laughs> but like you get, what, two hours of electricity a day? Actually, it depends where you live. Okay. Like, I, I, I come from South of Lebanon. Yeah and we have like one to two hours of electricity per day. Uh -huh. There was a time back in 2021 and 2000, early 2020, we had no electricity for 14, 15 days. Yeah, straight, no whatsoever. So if you didn't have a backup generator of some kind of batteries or solar uh, energy powered house, you're out of luck. However, the government, well, as you know, we are broke. <laughs> they have no money to fund themselves at all. And this is the sad part. Even if they had funding coming, right? They wouldn't take it. Why? Because usually, like other governments, they would demand from the government that we will do it. We will fix it. We will pay for the repairs. But the government is like, no. We will take the money. We will fix it. But you know what happens when they take the money? It doesn't happen. It's gone. There is an electricity crisis throughout Lebanon. So I wanted to understand how the people are navigating this challenge. Walking through neighborhoods in the suburbs of Beirut, it becomes evident that necessity has sparked innovation as homes and businesses alike are adorned with a patchwork of solutions. Generators are a common sight and are a testament to the locals' determination to maintain a semblance of normalcy. But it's not just generators. On rooftops, solar panels catch the sun's rays, a silent yet powerful statement of resilience. Hi, how are you? Nice Good. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank nice you for having you. us. You're welcome. Anytime. So we, uh, we went to the uh, Ministry of Electricity. Yes. Yeah, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> it's normal in Lebanon. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to show us what you're doing here for electricity, yeah? Yes. All right, cool. Okay. So, you know, we have a generator for the building. Yeah. We use it from time to time. But with the high cost of fuel, it costs you too much. And then we decided to put, you know, the solar uh, panel and the inverter. So now we are much, much better and we don't count anymore on the electricity. So this is interesting because you've got yes. solar power. Exactly. The grid? This is the grid when you have electricity or a generator of the building working. This is the house. Yeah. Now, since the uh, generator of the building is on, this one fill the battery yeah. and fill the house to use electricity. When there is no electricity, it will be from the solar panel yeah. and from the battery that they are charging the house and having right. electricity. Diesel engine generator 
That's your backup for your backup. It's a backup for the backup. Go You're a power guy backup. now. Yeah, I, I know more than any electrician coming in. But it feels like Lebanon's at the point now where essentially there is two sides to Lebanon. Everyone's just found a way to cope and survive outside of government. Look, the trust is important. Yeah. Even now, if the government come and tell you like they did before, we're going to have electricity 24 hours or 10 hours, whatever. You cannot trust because they fail many times. So yeah. you have to be able to uh, cover your needs by yourself. You cannot count on other people. We're, we're in. Can we see the solar panels? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Let's go. Okay, great. You can see them across all the other roofs. Yeah. I mean, everybody. But did people look, have this look, before? Look down. No, no. Those were in, they were installed uh, two months ago. The other one down. Also two months ago. So nobody had solar power before. And never. Now because everything. Never in Lebanon. Again, yeah. people figure out a way. Exactly. And some people now, those days, when the government or when the electricity comes from the government to your house, mm -hmm. I'm turning it off because this is cheaper than, than the government <laughs> electricity. So they use their panel, their backup, and that's it. It's funny. So the government figures out how to break things. Yes. And then everyone else figures out how to fix things. Every building must be an option whenever you build a house yeah. to have the panel ready for the new it's tenant. It's crazy. You can see literally every one of these houses. You can see them everywhere. Every building they have. It's a good business to be in if you've got yes. electricity, uh, solar power. Yes. The impact of the electricity crisis becomes more apparent at night. At the end of each day, large parts of the city are plunged into complete darkness revealing the true extent of the power shortages upon the city. But hope is being restored through the efforts of Rebirth Beirut. This charitable organization is on a mission to restore power, one street at a time, bringing much needed light to businesses and neighborhoods. Since the, the uh, economic crisis and after the blast, the electricity would come almost one or two hours a day only. So the streets were really shrouded in darkness for a very long time. And Beirut was really a ghost town and it was scary. So uh, shops, restaurants wouldn't open at night because of that. There were no pedestrians because they were afraid to walk, um, be robbed, let alone uh, just fall and break a, a leg or something. Light is life. And we thought that if we bring light back to the city, that would bring back the beating heart of the city. And this is what we did. Wait, so this is one of the streets you've done? Yes, this is one of the streets. I mean, when Mustafa? Oh, okay. So from that lamp you can see over there, that's where we started, La Hadid. And until the, la the end of the street. We've done 15 intersections so far uh, on solar power. And our street lighting project is in collaboration with the local community and the private sector. So we look for uh, hotels, malls, hospitals, uh, big corporations, buildings that have their own private generators and then can provide electricity to the existing poles and we give them a rebate on their fuel consumption. So they get a rebate through our partner who is the fuel provider. And how are you funding this? It's so far been uh, from private corporations um, in Lebanon. Uh, or individuals, okay. uh, so it's corporations that adopt a street or adopt a traffic okay. light. Okay, okay. How big's the team? How many people work on it? Uh, three people plus the founder, so we're just four people. Wow, you've done a lot with four people. Yeah, yeah. How big is this project? How much work is there to do? This is the map of yeah. Greater Beirut, yeah. I'm assuming the pink and yellow lines are either stuff you've done or you want to do. Yeah, exactly. So this is like when we want to plan for a street and we want to look for uh, the institutions or the uh, buildings that uh, help us. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. There's 1,350 streets in Beirut, there's 20 avenues, and there's 110 traffic light intersections. So we've done 15 out of the 110. Uh, we've done 110 streets out of the 1,350. Okay. And we've done nine avenues out of the 20. So they, the, your resources, are they, is that your biggest challenge? Yes, definitely. Uh, financial resources, yeah. So if you had more money, what could you do? Is it just a quicker rollout? 
definitely quicker, but also more streets, more infrastructure projects. We want to rehabilitate the public gardens. Okay. Uh, we want to plant trees in the streets of Beirut. Uh, we want to do uh, something like an academy to uh, teach people so that they can come out and enter the job market directly. You're essentially building out an NGO that infills the services that historically were provided by the government. Yes, we're, we're, we're filling a gap. Yeah. It's so rewarding at the end when you see the impact on yeah. the people, when you see how people feel more safe, more secure walking at night. Uh, businesses, uh, restaurants in the area have told us that their turnover has increased by 20% Amazing. or more. And can, can you contextualize what a certain amount of money would do? Like what would $1,000 do or what would $10,000 do? A small street would cost around $2,000 without the lead light. Um, a medium street would cost around $3,000 and an avenue could cost uh, around 5,000. So you accept in Bitcoin? Uh, not yet, but... We uh, uh, we're, <laughs> well, uh, we need a course about Bitcoin so we can start to use it. But you just yeah. need a button, you can convert <laughs> it straight to dollars. There'll be a bunch of Bitcoiners watching this film and they might, they might give you some money. Oh, great, that would be perfect. Okay, where are we going to dinner tonight? Because all I've done is eat here. <laughs> We're going to a place down the street in Jamaize. It's called Dar Jamaize. It's okay. super yummy. Yeah, we're recording now the dinner. Or... Well, just because I want to show you some magic. Download Wallet of Satoshi. From App, App Store? Yeah, I'm going to show you the magic. Okay. But everything else about learning about Bitcoin okay. is going to be down to you okay. and Ralph or other people. Okay. Start. I'm going to click send. Okay. Osh, he received it. I'm... Fifty thousand. Wow. Okay. Yes. Watch this. Watch this. <laughs> so how much is that? How it's much? Like is thirteen that... bucks. Done. Done. Okay. That's how wow. quickly it went from there to there, right? Wow. So Bitcoiners can be generous if they like a project. If you put that QR code up on the internet, yeah, we should do it now. Uh, Let's do it. We'll do it. But anyway, you put the QR code up on the internet and say, donate to this project. Um. People will just click on the QR code and start sending money. And after your program. And anywhere in the world, people can do it. And the great thing is, there's no middleman at all. Yeah. Take a screenshot of the QR code. Yeah. And send it to me and Beetle. I'll do the same. Okay. okay. Well, you can just retweet me. I will. Yeah. And we hope that our uh, project will be seen by uh, many of you. Again, oh, again, happened. again. Wow, amazing. It's really working. It's, it's just the magic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. Like again, more. <laughs> yeah, he has uh, yeah. half a million followers on wow. Twitter, so this might go on all night. Yeah. So you will not sleep. Tonight. I won't sleep tonight, though. No. <laughs> Tomorrow she wakes up, I free time. <laughs> so Pascal is the store, which is right underneath our offices, uh -huh. and because we lit the street, Pascal knows what the value of light is and what the value of darkness we were living is. Before and after. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so what did it mean? What's the difference then? We didn't choose to open by night. Oh, you didn't? So, yes. Yeah. It was uh, like a city of shadow team by night. Now it's a switch. Everybody is enjoying uh, coming in Jumeirah by night. Okay. Full security, thanks to Rebirth Beirut. It's almost like you're getting to live normal life. So, yeah, like yeah. you're getting to be. Lebanon again, be Beirut, because with the lights comes a spirit, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Beirut is known for as a city of, of uh, nightlife, of people wanting to live, wanting to eat, uh, drink, dance. Uh, even you can see, even, like. even if we're living in hell now, we're still smiling, because we have the hope. Yeah. <laughs> I was conscious of the disparities that often exist between a capital city and rural communities. So I wanted to get out of Beirut. I wanted to understand the economic impact on other parts of Lebanon. It's being guarded by a goat. It's a guard goat. <laughs> and there's a dog. It's definitely being guarded. This is what I've heard. It's kind of owned by a family and they have connections with politicians. And, you know, he kind of takes a percentage of the politician. 
and he provides kind of political cover. Political cover for what, though? What, what? Because a lot of these things aren't necessarily re regulated or technically legal. I mean, they're literally taking the, the rock. They're, they're, they're literally they're, stealing they're the land. Stealing They've the taken land. all the money, now they're, they're stealing the, they're, taking the land. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things like that. I think the summary for Lebanon is, like, if you're connected, you can just take what the fuck you want. Uh, yeah, I agree. Do they milk the goats here? Yeah, well, why not? Do you mind if I get shit in your car? Yeah, you will. All right. Is he going to kick me? Now, what do I do? Man, they're bollocks, aren't they? Yeah, I did it. It's my first, first time I've milked a goat. <laughs> oh, look at it. Is he giving me this one? <laughs> Come on, down you go. Key him out. My boy's tired, my boy's tired. Come on, man, I'm like 20 years older than you. I agree, but I eat too much. <laughs> That's your, uh, all your time in Lebanon before me. We've got to get to our meeting. Team, he's saying God bless you. Thank you. That was a cool little detour. Thank you, we're going to head back. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy my see after the you. Here in the rural communities of Lebanon, the recent economic crisis has cast a long shadow. The poverty rate among Lebanese has soared to an alarming 55%, with extreme poverty reaching 23%. Syrian refugees face an even more daunting reality, with 88% living in extreme poverty. But this crisis has especially affected Lebanon's youth, forcing many to make harsh sacrifices. Over 40% have had to cut back on education just to afford the basic needs of food and medicine. The average monthly income for those young people is around $64, as many are forced into low-paying informal jobs. My name is Cla uh, Claudia. Claudia? Yeah. Claudia and Dahir Dahir is the dad. Okay, and these are your sons? And your daughter? Three boys? Yeah. Three boys. Yeah. So your girlfriend? No, yeah. friend. Friend. Yeah, friend. All right. <laughs> Friend? <laughs> okay. And uh, what's your what's your son's name? Shadi. 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 How has this economic crisis affected you? Hey, I've been to New York a few times. 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 And I'm assuming you haven't or can't work because you have to look after your two sons? عنده ضمور بالدماغ. You know, they have specific situations, you know, uh, one of her kids are on wheelchair because they can't, they don't have balance, uh, they fall, they break body parts, so she always has to be around family, just take care of them. How old is Robin? How old 20. Are you? Probably. He's 20 years 20, old. 20 years old. Uh, what opportunities are there for you as a young person? And, uh, How do you feel about your future in Lebanon? Do you feel under pressure? I'm under pressure. 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 I'm under
يعني بدي اعبي بنزين للسياره وهلا عم بفهم تقسيط للسياره كل الشهر ايه كل الشهر كله ايه يعني ما حرام قد ما في بيساعدنا حنون حرام مش انه هال So all your money goes to the family. Oh, and the family. No, no, مصرياتك بيروح على سعر. بيحطون. بيلي شو بدك يا ماما وبعدها يعني أنا ما إلي قلب كتير كمينا ومجبور حرام بيلي إنه أنتوا أهله. So how do how do you feel about the financial crisis as a young person? How do you feel about everything that's happened? إنه هذا بس بعد شغل شغل بعد كل شيء رايح. إنه إنه بس بعد شغل شغل بعد بعد. يعني يعني. ما فيش مشاريع. ما تروح وتجي تطلع تنظر وتضب شوي يعني بعدين للمستقبل للجائزه للجائزه للسيارة فيش ما فيش هال وكل الصبايا والشباب تحسهم حرام زيت الحكي انه ما فينا نعمل شيء ما في مستقبل ما في مش عم يفكروا لقدام ما في مش خربان الدنيا بايت شغل ما فيش طموح لبعدين we say eat, sleep, rinse, repeat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, is, it, is this causing you any stress? Do you, do you think about it a lot? Does it affect you? His mom was saying that he's, he gets angry very quickly because he's under so much pressure, under so much stress, and you know he cares so much about his, his family, his brothers, specifically that you know, he's always stressed out. It's all the time. I think that's about as difficult a situation as you can possibly see. You know, the dad's deaf and struggling to find work. The mom has to look after two disabled kids. And then the third son, who's essentially taken the role and responsibility of the family, and you know he's got a job, he earns hundred dollars a month, and he's taken full, essentially full responsibility for bringing in the money for his family, so a year older than my son, and and that's like a stolen future. He he should be able to be out with friends and yeah have opportunity for the future and be able to yeah think about work and put some money by, and, and there's just no future for these people because these motherfuckers stole it from them. Um, and that's really, I don't know, man, it's like, you, you, you go to Beirut and you see things happen and you think, okay, you can re start rebuilding Beirut and then you come here and you're like, where do you even start? How do you even, how do you even make a difference here? And so that's really throwing me. This economic crisis in Lebanon brings with it an undercurrent of mental health struggles, born out of desperation and uncertainty. Families and individuals now find themselves caught in a relentless tide of inflation, dire employment prospects and inevitable poverty. The strain of financial insecurity is immense. It manifests itself in mental health problems as people struggle to cope with an overwhelming sense of helplessness and despair. How big is the problem here in Zahir? Seriously, it's a huge because, you know, uh, always I, I say that the, this, this example, uh, some, uh, some families who supported Caritas in the past, now they come to our office to ask for aid, for aid. <laughs> يعني أنا بس يجوا لهم بس يبقوا ما ما نقدرين نساعدهم 
وانا قادرين نعطي غير كلنا نحن هالخمس جمعيات مجمعين لنعطي كل عائلة مش عم نوصل للبرميل المزود لانه يصير غالي مشكلة كتير كبيرة مدارس مشكلة كبيرة تتأسف انه نحن مدرسنا انه عم تقطوا كلها بالدولار والعالم انا قادرة تدفع في مشكلة كبيرة هون But there is there's a mental health crisis here in Lebanon that no one wants to talk about. So, so how are you personally coping with this? <laughs> everything is gone. This is it, when everything's so bad, you get that kind of like laughter, but it's not a laughing yeah. at it's like... Uh, does anything give you hope? بس منصلي لأنه لبنان ربنا حافظه شو متكلين عليك؟ She just prays because Lebanon is protected by God. Lebanon's economic woes lies in a deeply entrenched system of corruption. At the core is a cohort of political and business elites who have siphoned off the country's wealth, precipitating a severe financial downturn. This exclusive circle has managed to sustain their opulent lifestyles while the rest of the nation plunges into economic hardship. In Lebanon, it's hard for a lot because there are a lot of issues. If you want to get this issue, this issue will start to defend from the beginning. And even if it's not a problem. And it's, yeah. it's, it's very difficult in Lebanon because it's religious. Politics is religious. So mm. if you come and you know, attack a specific political party, you're kind of attacking a religious group. So then they'll have to retaliate. So people become entrenched within their politics because it's also their religion. You need a party of unity, but... <laughs> oh, man. Do you think any... Is there any way of fixing this? The only way is to change the entire political class. This minister represented the minister one of the third in the world, not in Lebanon, in the تاني كمو كينسي عنده شي خمستاشر مليار دولار. There's there's one guy who's one of the richest guys not even Lebanon in the world. He has almost like fifteen billion dollars. What? He's just a he's a politician. البلد البلد اللي هو من العالم ميت من جوع. And the country that he's from, people are dying of hunger. I mean, look, I'm laughing because it's. I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm just laughing because it's unbelievable. It's just outright open theft. It's kind of evil. Yeah. He gave you a Lebanese vo uh, proverb. Okay. And then he's like, when things are so bad, you start laughing. Yeah. 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 That's it. It's like, oh my God. Uh, we have some politicians are uh, from the top uh, richest men in the world in Lebanon, and they are from Tip uh, Tripoli, the the city that uh, had the maximum poverty. One of them is uh, uh, Rais al How did he get so rich? Uh, from stealing the money of uh, <laughs> of the pop uh, population. The people who are in need. We don't see them. When you go to the restaurant, you see them full of people and eating. It's like there is no economic crisis. In fact, it's 5% of the people. The rest are, are in a very, very difficult situation. They cannot go to the hospital. They cannot do insurance if they are, if are sick. But yet, if you ask me what we need in Lebanon first, is it justice, the rule of law, the rule of law. When you have this, everything will start again. I, st I believe in this, in this country. This is, you know, after three years of the most complex and difficult and worse economical crisis with S, because there are five economies at the same place, some five crises, this country is still alive. But I'm afraid of one thing, Peter. We have almost 80% of the young generation that is leaving the country. And brain drain is 
is a big problem, okay? It's the worst asset that you can lose. So you need this, these brains that are leaving the country to re, re believe in it. For this, you need to give them hope. You give them vision. You have to give them dream. In the midst of Lebanon's economic crisis, there are inspiring stories of resilience. There are a growing number of entrepreneurs forging a new path in these challenging times. But you, but you do how many a day? All the branches together? Like this branch would do 1,500 a day. So you're making seven thousand dollars a day just on hookah. Yeah. I need to bring hookah to <laughs> England, don't I? It's a big industry. But they call it something else, don't they? Shisha. Yeah. Shisha. yeah I think they call it shisha in England for, for a specific reason. Nergile in Arabic. You can't get away in England by saying we've got the best hookah in town. <laughs> Over the last five years, you've had COVID, economic crisis, revolution. The fact you're still here with the business is amazing. You have mentioned a couple of things with hyperinflation, price fluctuation that was crazy, like up and down, you know. It's not about the fact that it was just growing up where you had to adjust. It was going up, then going down. So what do you do? Do you reduce your prices now? You had the issue between, okay, and then you have the side of your clients, then you have the side of your suppliers, right? So I want to increase my prices, great, to maintain, to be able to, you know, to maintain my cost. But then, okay, the, then the lira jobs, then my clients expects me to lower my prices, but then my suppliers don't want to lower their prices because it's fluctuating. So, you know, what do you do? 2021, 2022, we weren't fully dollarized, so you'd receive money in, in Lebanese pounds but then you'll have to wire transfer those funds abroad in US dollars and you have the bank crisis. Are you allowed to wire transfer? Uh, do you have, we had to create fresh accounts, no fresh accounts. It was, you know, a chaotic uh, scene as well. Because at some, even if you had uh, a US dollar account, you couldn't use it. I know that people don't trust the banks here because they can't, you know, they have access to their accounts closed down, right? And so people find a way of getting around though. They get paid, they, turn it straight into dollars, they have safes in their house, whatever. There's a range of ways to do it, but you, you can't really do that with a business. You need a bank. But well, we became a cash industry. My suppliers, really? yeah, yeah. At some, so throughout all, 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 all the years before, you know, you had the credit system yeah. with your suppliers, you know, he, he'd take some, you know, he'd give you like a kind of credit line without being like with, with the bank, with himself, right? He'd hold some of the weight on him. Every, when, when everything broke, it's as if, in a way, we've called it like as if everything reset. You had a, like a credit with this supplier for $40,000. Okay, so the deal was with the supplier. Okay, let's forget what we owe each other because how do you pay that $40,000? Do you pay it on the fresh, on the new rate, on the old rate, on the official rate, on the black market rate? Like, you know, it was really chaotic. Mm. So we're like, okay, let's forget that for now until to see how things happen. And let's start from new, from scratch, from today, but it's going to be a cash. What I've seen is there's two Lebanons. There is the old Lebanon. Corruption, lira, dysfunctional government, tensions, all that bullshit. And there's a new Lebanon where people have had enough and they're rebuilding it themselves. We haven't had a government for three years, but nothing. But it's actually, it's working. And it's been like this for the last two, three years. No government, nothing. Zero between each other, trusting each other without any governments at all, even contract at some point. Because I've worked in Canada, I've studied in Canada, been abroad a lot, studied and worked in Brazil as well. I'm gonna tell you something super controversial. Yeah. I think a chaotic system works better than an organized system. Like, we have to make it happen. Like, it's so funny now, like, I read something, I was like, Lebanon in terms of the transition to this kind of, you know, sustainable energy that all the world is on it right now. It's like, we didn't have a choice. It's so crazy on what I'm saying, but an organized chaos, I think, works more than an organized system. Mm -hmm. When an organized system, I think the weight is so heavy, the cost is so heavy, like, you know, opening a restaurant right now, open one in Canada and in the US, costs you millions of dollars. Yeah. I can do the same restaurants with same profitability here with $100,000. What does it say? It encourages me as an entrepreneur. I want to open money, I want to invest. While some might view Bitcoin as a panacea for Lebanon's economic troubles, its adoption remains limited. The truth is that people want the stability offered by the US dollar. But this highlights a critical step in financial evolution. There is a need for foundational economic stability as a precursor to Bitcoin wealth preservation. 
usually in places that are struggling, you know, difficult financial economic situations, we see larger Bitcoin adoption. But it feels like here in Lebanon, whilst you've got that Bitcoin adoption, most people have gone to the dollar. Before we had in hyperinflation back in 2019 in Lebanon, I always believed that Bitcoin is the solution to the problem. Yeah. Right? But it turns out I was delusional. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a serious issue when it's happening around the world in the first world countries that people think that Bitcoin fixes everything. It does fix everything on the long term. Well, we but, don't know that. Well, we, we hope so. We, I hope, mean, so. we hope so. We, we, we aim towards that. But Bitcoin doesn't instantly fix an economy that's already broken. Mm -hmm. When we hit the hyperinflation in Lebanon, I, I really thought that everyone's going to accept Bitcoin. They will see that Bitcoin has a value and, and there's going to be a Bitcoin hyper, hyper Bitcoinized country. But it's not. People went into shit coins. People would jump into crypto stuff just to make quick money. Look, I, I really believe, that's my personal belief, that Bitcoin really fixes everything. And actually, on the long term, Bitcoin is the answer to what the problems we have right now. But the transition from Lebanese lira to dollar and from the dollar to Bitcoin into will really take a lot of time. People feel safe and confident in, into dollar uh, and gold more than, than, than Bitcoin. It's something totally new for them. Right. Look, uh, when it comes to Lebanon, they never really trusted the, the electronic bank system. We never been... Uh, a cashless system. We've always been cash society. So people, if you try to introduce them into Bitcoin, it's abstract for them. As my time in Lebanon neared its end, I felt compelled to revisit Samar. Her unwavering resilience amid the pressures of life in Beirut had left a lasting impression on me. And she also had some exciting news. She had received enough Bitcoin donations to restore electricity to yet another street. Is this it? Is this it? Is this yeah. the one? Yeah, this is the one. This is the one. Like, is this is one of the lions. Is it it's north? nine poles, nine poles. And how many have they left to do? Uh, no, no, no. They've done the whole thing. Oh, they have? They've done the whole street. This is just the last one. And where are they taking the power from? They're taking the power from, from a generator okay. uh, that provides to the whole street. And uh, yeah. So, so we'll get to see it all come on. Yes. Oh my god! <laughs> this is so cool. Yeah, just a simple tweet from a tweet from dinner. From a tweet, and we're gonna see this and an, and an impact on the actual community in the street. The neighborhood will be safer, will be more vibrant. They'll have a better quality of life. We're super overwhelmed. I mean, really, I still can't understand how this happened in such a I short told you, period. It's magic. <laughs> it is it's magic. magic. It is magic. It is totally magic. We've seen contributions from all around the world so yeah. it's it's really fascinating he's saying this will have like a super effect on my life my life will be more beautiful he's saying it's been like around three years since they had electricity on the street no wow he's so happy so he can see the robbers if there are any robbers. <laughs> Will they switch the whole street on in one go? Yeah, yeah. It's better that we wait a while just so that it's dark and then they will switch it on. Let there be light. Let there be light. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the 125 streets that we have done. It was completely dark. And now you will see when it will be back. That, that's it. <laughs> Woo! Bravo. Woo! Yay! <laughs> this is your Bitcoin no, community, man. This is you guys did it. No, you guys. This is so cool. Thanks to you. Really, seriously, I mean, if it works for your community. The neighbors that want to thank oh. also. Uh, don't thank me, they, they did it, they did it. Thank you, and thank, thank you. you. And especially thanks for the activity because it took really less than a week. He took the decision, he sent everybody and thanks for your birthday. Yeah, amazing. Four days ago, he did a, a simple tweet and today we're standing here on a lit street. Imagine that. The power of... The power of, of Bitcoin and the power of... The power this of solidarity. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> The power of positive change. I think Bitcoin is is. Uh... No, it's not. A, it's about people. About people. Right? It's about people. Yeah, true. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. What more can we do with this? No. <laughs> Leave it. Uh, 
Wow, what a week. Okay, there is a, there is a sadness and a depression that exists across Lebanon. And it makes sense. Like, they've had everything taken from them. You know, could you imagine waking up one day, going to your bank, and all your money's been taken? And it's happened to all your friends and family as well. And then, all the money you earn is suddenly worth nothing. You can't buy anything. And that's happened to the whole country. And so that's created a sadness across the whole country. And then this despondency, this lack of opportunity for the future, almost little hope here. But then you meet someone like Sama and she's building this project, uh, Rebirth Beirut. Given the opportunity, people will rebuild this country. You know, from one tweet out on Twitter to thousands of people sending money, this street is now lit. You know, these people here who live here on this street now have light and it's made a huge difference. <laughs> They're stopping and taking photos. And so as bad as things are here, you know, at least you can see this like, <laughs> this ray of light, as, as cringy as that sounds, you see this ray of light, this opportunity that if you get money into the hands of the people here and you leave them alone, they will rebuild this country. And yeah, what a great, what a really cool end to this trip.